In a 2010 interview with ESPN, Jean-Franco Casper, who was then president of the International Ski Federation and a member of the International Olympic Committee, defended excluding women from Olympic ski jumping by suggesting their uterus would fall out upon landing. <laughs> that claim is ridiculous. <laughs> but it wasn't a random misogynistic outburst. He believed that. A lot of people did. The once widespread belief that physical exertion as mild as running half a mile could cause a woman's uterus to fall out dates back at least to the early 1800s. But people at the pinnacle of sport are still perpetuating this myth into the 21st century because despite the success of the 1972 passing of Title IX, which ushered in the last 50 years of high female participation in sport, female representation in research remains generations behind. A September 2021 analysis of all sport and exercise science research conducted between 2014 and 2020 found that just 6% of athletic performance research focuses on females. There's three things worth noticing in this graph. First, this gender gap is huge. Second, this data is really recent. And third, if you look at the trend over these six years, it's not getting any better. There are a number of justifications offered for research's gender gap, from the increased expense required to control for the confounding effects of the menstrual cycle, to the fact that there are more male athletes, or that men are more willing to volunteer for research. But despite the added challenges, this lack of representation needs addressing because in the absence of research, we're left to rely on folklore. And like the folklore of the falling uterus, which unnecessarily sidelined generations of potential female athletes, folklore gets it wrong. So I'm here to make the case that we need a Title IX for research. <laughs> Over the last decade, I've recorded my every heartbeat, every workout, every sleep. I've even recorded things like my daily mood and caffeine intake. As the Senior Vice President of Data Science and Research at WHOOP, I've also poured over similar data from millions of people. I'm fascinated by this data because continuous vital sign monitoring with wearable technology makes it possible to understand our bodies in ways we never imagined. But I just showed you the data, and this problem isn't getting better on its own. We're going to need the help of legislation to put much needed funds behind this problem. We're going to need something like a research edition of Title IX. To illustrate the power that wearables have to accelerate closing the research gender gap, today I'm going to share two important lessons my team and I uncovered while working on wearable data this year. Lesson one, reproductive hormones do more than reproduction. When I was in fifth grade, we had an awkward assembly in which we learned what a period was but we're discouraged from worrying about it beyond how to deal with the mess until we were ready for babies. In high school, we learned about the hormones involved. We learned that the menstrual cycle has two roughly 14-day phases, separated by menstruation, that's the bleeding, and ovulation, releasing an egg. From menstruation to ovulation is the follicular phase, during which levels of ovarian hormones, estrogen and progesterone are relatively low. From ovulation to menstruation is the luteal phase, during which levels of ovarian hormones are relatively high. But all I learned about progesterone was its vital role in sustaining a pregnancy. No one mentioned that when elevated in the luteal phase, it causes increased catabolism, a fancy word for breakdown, making it harder to build muscle or recover from exercise or that it increases our core body temperature, making us sweat more, and in doing so, lose salt, decreasing our tolerance to heat stress. In short, 
Nobody mentioned any of the many ways these hormones affect our daily lives, having nothing to do with reproduction. Last year, I wrote a paper, along with my colleague Laura Ware and research partner Dr. Stacy Sims, in which we used wearable data from 5,000 women across 14,000 menstrual cycles to look at the cardiovascular and nervous system's response to training by menstrual cycle phase. That's orders of magnitude more data than is typically included in exercise physiology research. Wearable technology has enabled data collection on a scale that was previously unimaginable by shrinking sensors that were big, bulky, and wired into discrete, comfortable, wireless devices capable of continuously and passively monitoring vital signs. The large data sets that result enable analyses that would be underpowered and therefore inconclusive on the small data sets typical of traditional academic exercise physiology research. Wearables are therefore uniquely well positioned to answer some very important questions. Using our unprecedentedly huge data set, we found that after controlling for the prior day's training load, we have significantly higher cardiovascular recovery during the follicular phase, that first half of our menstrual cycle, than during the luteal phase, the second half. These results suggest that if we modulate our training by training more during the follicular than the luteal phase, we should be able to take on more overall volume and make more efficient gains. But modulating training by menstrual cycle doesn't have to be limited to just modulating volume. This is particularly important for team sport athletes and those who don't have the luxury of customizing their daily training load. For example, since elevated progesterone during the luteal phase causes us to sweat more and lose salt, when training during the luteal phase, we should be faster to supplement with electrolytes and more conscientious about being well hydrated than might be necessary during the follicular phase. If women were properly educated, this is something we could easily and inexpensively take on individually, but that would make a huge difference in how you perform and feel half of the month. I was a gymnast before I could walk. I've run marathons, but in a lifetime of sport, I wasn't asked once by a coach or trainer when my last period was. By not modulating my training in response to my body's readiness to respond to that training, I was subjected to a higher risk of injury and slower rate of gains. When you think about it this way, it's no wonder that girls drop out of sport at puberty at twice the rate of boys, or that by age 17, when most are fully on the other side of puberty, 51% of girls have left sport. If we adapted their training to fit their hormonal reality, there's no reason why we couldn't reverse this trend. Lesson two, better safe than sorry isn't always safe. Now that we've touched on how worrisomely little we know about female exercise physiology, let me tell you about pregnant female exercise physiology. <laughs> the entirety of all peer-reviewed research, not merely relying on retrospective survey data collected postpartum that guides our knowledge of safe training during pregnancy, is so limited that you can, and I did, read it in a day. <laughs> There's a reason for this. We have powerful safeguards that ensure research involving any human subject minimizes risk. Additionally, the US Code of Federal Regulations defines pregnant women and the fetuses they carry as a vulnerable population requiring additional protection. But this additional protection comes with a catch and then it makes it extremely difficult to get approval for research and therefore significantly limits the research that gets done. Not doing research in order to protect fetuses puts them at risk in its own way. In that research not getting done means that knowledge isn't discovered. And when knowledge isn't discovered, we're left to make stuff up. And when we're left to make stuff up, we see over and over again that we get it wrong. In this knowledge vacuum, we adopt a better safe than sorry approach and warn that failure to keep training light during pregnancy can result in a miscarriage, 
literally the scariest word to a mom to be. But some well-meaning OBs define keeping it light as conservatively as lifting over 10 pounds or letting your heart rate climb above 140 beats per minute. These are common guidelines, but they're not supported by any research. We recently completed a project in collaboration with Dr. Sean Rowan at West Virginia University, which is still in peer review, but is the first study to use continuous vital sign monitoring from preconception through postpartum. We recruited women who were trying to get pregnant who exercise at least three times per week. For over a year, we monitored them around the clock. We monitored their sleep and training, and importantly, each night captured their resting heart rate, a metric known to be correlated with cardiovascular health and fitness and with acute risk of adverse cardiac events. Cardiovascular metrics, like resting heart rate, are known to worsen throughout pregnancy. But in our study, exercise modulated this effect. This is important because if increased exercise during pregnancy is associated with improved cardiovascular health, then this better safe than sorry approach that we're misguidingly adopting to prevent miscarriage is putting us at very real risk from a cardiovascular standpoint. The support for a causal relationship between being sedentary and preventing miscarriage is weak and rooted in folklore. But the support for a causal relationship between being sedentary and adverse cardiac and metabolic outcomes is profound and rooted in science. Being sedentary is associated with 112% increased risk of developing diabetes. During pregnancy, diabetes increases your risk of stillbirth and premature delivery. Being sedentary is also associated with a 30 to 50% increased risk of high blood pressure. During pregnancy, high blood pressure can lead to eclampsia, which while rare, is often fatal to both mom and baby. Beyond the really scary stuff, being sedentary is associated with more lower back pain, worse moods, and worse sleep. So before we go off and advocate for a better safe than sorry approach, let's please first do the work to ensure that the safe option is actually safe. What I hope you'll take away from my talk is that despite the authority with which they are so often presented, so much of what passes for best practices isn't rooted in rigorous science. And in the absence of rigorous science, we've chosen, or better put, the medical community has chosen for us, to err on the side of caution. This isn't to say that we should ignore our doctors and trainers, or that caution doesn't make a lot of sense when we don't have rigorous science with which to better define what's safe. But we shouldn't accept the status quo and stay cautious. We should demand better than the status quo and fund research. I wanna dedicate my research and this talk to my grandmothers and to all of the women who were unnecessarily sidelined on the basis of myth, and so never got to learn their true strength. It's been 50 years since Title IX made space for us to participate in sport. Imagine what we could accomplish in another 50 if we stopped settling for folklore and demanded that research, time, and money be put behind properly unlocking female performance. Thank you.